Hey, Saluki fans, Connor Onion here. Hope you're having a good week. Before we hear from Saluki women's basketball coach Cindy Stein, a reminder that the Saluki Standards podcast is brought to you by McAllister's Deli in Carbondale, famous for their sweet tea. They're located at 1382 East Main Street in Carbondale. Now let's get to our guest, Cindy Stein, the head coach of SIU women's basketball, who will in all likelihood reach 400 career wins this winter. Coach, you're, you're entering year eight, and um, I, I just had this strike me the other day. That makes you the second longest tenured coach at SIU now. Only Carrie Blaylock's got you beat. And Carrie's got me beat by a lot, too, by the way. Um, yeah, I should have put that in there. Yeah, but unfortunately, I'm older. Um, and I think that's what it tells you right there is like, I'm just old, I guess, you know? Yeah. You're the, you're the vet, you're one of the veterans in the department though. Once, I guess once Rick Walker retired, um, that, that slid you up to the number two spot. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's something that I wanted to acclaim to, but I'll take it. You know, I think that, uh, with uh, being the age I am, um, I think experience is everything in this world. <laughs> that's right. Well, you got uh, some players back on campus this weekend. Um, what are the next couple of weeks going to look like now that you, you have some, some personnel back? Well, right now, you know, when they got here on Saturday, they pretty much had to sit for seven days. Um, they get their temperature taken twice a day. Uh, we did uh, actually get tested for COVID today. So that was a fun experience. And uh, they'll get their physicals on Friday or Saturday. And then uh, on Monday, we'll start voluntary workouts, which means our strength coach and our athletic trainer can be around. And uh, they can do conditioning and they can do some strength training. So it's kind of getting them back on that uh, wheel of what we normally do during the summer. And then July 20th, we can start summer access, which means we can work them out as coaches um because right now we can't even watch their voluntary workouts they're here right. and we we have to hope that our strength trainer is doing a great job it, when uh when you can actually be hands-on uh what all can you do are there limitations or well we'll still only have eight hours which of course will continue the strength training part of it um and probably some conditioning and then we'll take over probably four hours of that with um individual skill instruction um, and do more basketball conditioning things than just have them outside running. I'm sure you're probably sick of having Zoom meetings at this point. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you've had a ton of them this spring, but uh, what are some of the creative ways you guys have uh, tried to implement some of the new pieces you've, you've had and also keep the returning players together? Yeah, I think that actually I've really enjoyed the Zoom because, especially in recruiting, because you actually get to see kids' reactions to what you say or do, you know? So a lot more of them laugh at my jokes than I thought. So, of course, I'm liking it uh, there. Um, but then I get to where I'm meeting with our players and they don't laugh at my jokes anymore, and now I see the roll of the eye. So I'm not sure if that one's good. But, um, but no, honestly, it's been good. So, um, you know, we've been able to really kind of uh, get with the returners, get with the newbies, and kind of just ask them questions, uh, doing things to help them get to know one another well. Uh, we've actually done some, hey, here's some plays we we're probably going to run coming up. Um, you know, just throwing different things at them. You know, a lot of them want to know what kind of exercises they can do now at home. So you'll show them where they can go on YouTube and who you'd probably recommend they watch. And I mean, you're just constant. It's, um, you know, I think you are my fifth thing that I had to do today. So the other four were all zoom calls. So, <laughs> well, here you are again. I'm glad you're not, again. I'm, I'm glad you're not sick of them. <laughs> and I, I'm just, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, your fans on this podcast cannot see your background on your, on this Zoom because I've never seen somebody look like as young as you in a, in a nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a 15 year old looking person with a bouquet behind me sitting in a rocking chair. <laughs> so I told you I'm ready. I'm ready for story time. But your background, I think you got me beat with your background. You got a pretty sweet court design behind you. Yeah, and I've actually, you know, when we show our recruits the videos, I have to explain that the court they see behind me is not the court they actually see in our facilities video because Coach Kill totally 
uh, nixed my idea. I wanted us to be really bold and have a crazy design on the floor with like chains and dog bones and, you know, the, the dog claw ripping apart the paint. And I wanted us to go all out and coach kill was like, Nope, uh, that's crazy. Uh, he wanted conservative and, uh, that's what we got. We got conservative. <laughs> you got to get down there and paint it yourself, I guess. But yeah, you got, but you got, uh, like dog claws by the, um, by the blocks. Yeah. And then there's something inside the three point line too. What is that? The fence, the defense. Yeah. It's just what was the cover of the paint or the lane up to the three point line. That was the opening of a actually a dog house. So there's eyeballs looking out at you. <laughs> did you design this yourself or did you have help with that? Well, I did ask, I requested Michael Black's help with it. Um, okay. But that's, a, you know, it was hard because I'm like, Michael, we got to do this, this, and this. And then Coach Kill's going, no, we need to do this, this, and this. So, um, obviously, Coach Kill's votes were a lot uh, more weighted than mine. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, if you drew that yourself, um, you you got you to help out the graphic design people a little bit more. Yeah, there's, yeah. I wish I was that talented. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to this because, uh, you know, we get a chance to talk a lot throughout the season about, you know, your team, obviously, but we don't get a, a whole lot of opportunities to kind of dive into your career journey. Um, you know, growing up in Peoria, I want to go all the way back then. Uh -oh. um, what, uh, what led you to sports growing up? You know, I always just love sports. I mean, I um, you know, I had two older brothers. I was probably following them around all the time. I mean, I grew up playing baseball and, and football and, you know, um, soccer and tennis and basketball. I mean, it was just nonstop. And obviously basketball is a huge thing in the Peoria area. Um, I grew up watching Bradley basketball. I mean, I, um, I personally knew Stan Albeck, um, I knew Dick Versace. I knew his assistant coaches. Um, I watched all their games in the field house. Um, I watched Larry Bird play in the field house. I saw Reggie Theus play, uh, Roger Fagley, Hersey Hawkins. I mean, I could I, – I tell Andrea Gorski, who is now the Bradley coach, I know more about Bradley history uh, than she does, and she's working there. So, um, But it just gave me a great avenue to obviously, you know, I just had a passion for basketball, always have. And um, I think that growing up in Peoria definitely nurtured that. When did you realize, that, I mean, because obviously you went on and, and played at a high level too in college. Um, what was the point you realized you had a gift for playing sports? Um, well, it was really the only thing I really liked doing. So I didn't really like school a whole lot. I didn't see its purpose. <laughs> so, um, but I just, it's just something I always liked doing. And, and honestly, even in fifth grade, I mean, my fifth grade basketball teacher wasn't very good or my coach, she wasn't very good and she'd be the first one to admit it. So uh, I was always kind of showing them what we should be doing and just by watching basketball and my brothers being with them and, um, so I felt like I was always telling everybody what to do. So um, coaching just seemed pretty natural when I got to um, graduating. Yeah, I was going to say, I was, I was going to ask you about that. What led you to coaching? Um, I mean, was there, was there somebody that told you like, Hey, you're kind of a natural leader or was it something you just kind of found out on your own that, yeah, that, well, that was something you could do? In, in high school, it was funny because, you know, I played three sports. I played volleyball, softball, and basketball but I think it was my junior year, my athletic director uh, at my high school, um, uh, Ty Franklin, he pulled me aside and he goes, hey, you know, they've passed Title IX and you're going to be able to go to college and play on a basketball scholarship. And that's the first time I ever heard someone saying that. I was, I was working, I was trying to raise money to go play or to go to college because I, you know, my parents had five kids. They weren't going to be able to send everybody. So I knew I was going to have to pay for it. And he's like, you're not going to pay for it. You're, you know, you're going to be able to find a scholarship. So that's the first time I heard about it. Um, and then I, I, my senior year in high school, I had a great coach um, in Mary Kay Hungate, who's now the assistant athletic director at Louisiana tech. And um, she, uh, I always played post my first three years in high school. And obviously, you know, I'm five, seven. Um, so she moved me to a shooting guard, which I really liked. 
Um, and then from there, you know, I just, I felt like my, when I got moved to the position, I felt like I needed to play. I saw my, you know, uh, ability in my career, playing career blossom. So you didn't really have any visions before somebody told you, hey, this Title IX thing happened. You didn't have any visions of, of being a college athlete. Well, no, you didn't hear about it. You didn't hear girls going and getting scholarships. And, you know, I was pretty fortunate. I mean, we actually, uh, the junior college in our town in East Peoria, they played all the Division I teams. So it was Illinois Central College. They were playing the University of Illinois and the University of Iowa and Illinois State and, and Eastern Illinois and Western Illinois, and they were beating them. So I, uh, the coach there was Lorreen Ramsey, Hall of Fame coach. Um, she called me up and said, I don't know why you would look at anybody else, because at that time I had an offer from Bradley and Eastern Illinois and Iowa. And um, I ended up turning down a scholarships to go play at Illinois Central. And I had to pay for it. Um, and then from there, obviously, I got recruited by Illinois. And, of course, growing up, Peoria is a huge University of Illinois area. Um, so it was like, honestly, you didn't think of really playing for anybody but Illinois um, when you grow up in Peoria. So, or it was Bradley, which, you know, I obviously wanted out of town. So, right. Um, so you ended up going to Illinois and, and was lucky enough when I was playing, uh, my assistant coach got the central Michigan job. So when I was graduating, she asked me to be her GA and I was coaching in college ever since then. You know, you mentioned the Title IX thing, but also when you go to Illinois, um, it's this exciting time for opportunities for women. Uh, the NCAA tournament starts for women your first year at Illinois. Yeah, um, that, was, that was fun. What do you remember about kind of the pomp and circumstance and the excitement surrounding playing in that first tournament? Yeah, I mean, it was such a great thing because everything was AIAW. And then my first year at Illinois, it got to be where, hey, we're going to have the first NCAA tournament for women. Um, and they were only picking 32 teams and we were one of the 32. So we, you know, it was a big deal. I mean, we obviously celebrated that. Um, we, we knew it was a big deal at the time, but honestly, you know, when you're in it, you're like, okay, our coach is working us out too hard. We got a tournament, <laughs> you know, I mean, those are some of the things you remember. It's like, oh man, we ran a lot yesterday and we got to play Kentucky, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> a lesson moving forward for you for your coaching career. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, well, you mentioned your start, you know, you, you um, get to be a GA at Central Michigan. Um, you're an assistant, I think, for what, about a decade before you get your first head coaching yeah. job? Do I have that right? Something like yeah, that? Yeah, I don't know. I say I don't count those. <laughs> I don't count the years, so. Um, but from what I remember, you were pretty young when you got your first head coaching job, 32, 33, something like that, at Emporia State. Um, why do you think you were able to, um, you know, succeed as an assistant fast and get that first opportunity pretty quickly? Well, you know, it was a time where women's basketball was just kind of starting to grow where um, there was a lot more programs. So I was able to be a GA and there was only one assistant at Central Michigan to have an, obviously a lot of opportunities to do a lot of different things, to go into Miami of Ohio and, and becoming a recruiting coordinator um, um, and Cincinnati, same thing, and then, you know, move to Bradley and actually get more responsibilities. And, um, you know, I th feel like, you know, I, I then went to Illinois because obviously that's a whole, a whole nother level of responsibility. So I felt like I was growing and getting so much practical experience that, uh, you know, the opportunity at Emporia State presented itself. And honestly, that's, um, I tell everybody that that was probably the single best decision I've ever made in my life was to go to Emporia State because uh, I absolutely loved it, and I could have stayed there my whole career because they're fantastic people. Um, and But it also taught me what to look for when I was looking for jobs, and that is, um, you know, people make the place. And so always go where there's good people, and you, that it's going to be a good decision. And I've been able to follow that and, and have some really good success. It's funny that you say you could have stayed there your whole career because you succeeded right away. And then you moved on pretty quickly. Uh, that that third year, you guys are thirty three and zero, heading into the national title game. You're the coach of the year. Um, what memories stay with you from from that season? 
I, you know, I remember the the players the most because they were a gritty group of kids. I could have told them to, th- you know, to run through the wall and they would have. Um, I told them at the time because we ended up, we were 33-0 and going into the national championship game and then we lost that national championship game. And literally, when I walked into that locker room, our kids had pushed the second place trophy into the shower. They didn't want to look at it. They were so disappointed, you know, and that was really heartbreaking as a coach because it was, it was a great year. It was a very successful year. And I kept telling them, you guys will think back at this and you're going to remember what a great thing that you just accomplished. And honestly, I think they um, inducted that team into the Emporia State Hall of Fame. And they all said that, that, you know, they finally appreciated it, you know, 10 years later, you know, but, uh, so they're missing. Do you remember? Is there a missing trophy out there somewhere? Is it still yeah. in the shower? No, I, we made sure that that thing got home. But, <laughs> you know, but that's the that's kind of the integrity of the, those kids. I mean, they were just amazing kids. And, you know, honestly, you know, going to Mizzou from Emporia State, I didn't think I was had a chance for the job, I'll be honest. Mm. I mean, they had interviewed like 12 people, you know, Kim Mulkey being one of them, and they didn't – I kept reading in the paper how – you know, they just couldn't find anybody. You know, people kept turning the job down. So I actually gave my manager a hundred bucks to drive to Columbia, Missouri and hand the, he had to personally hand the athletic director our highlight tape and with a note that had a article that was in the paper about our program and with a note saying, hey, call me if you're interested, <laughs> thinking there's no way, right? Joe Castiglione was the AD at Mizzou at that time. And I'm like, there's just no way, you know, but it's worth a hundred dollars, right? It's like, you know, putting money down on yourself. And um, literally uh, the very next day, uh, Joe Castiglione called me and asked me to come in for an interview and I got the job. Wow. Manager's a good agent. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He was a good guy. He was a good dude. Uh, I'm sure it had to have helped that you're the national coach of the year at the division two level that season. Um, I, I did want you to, if, if you're willing to share the story, you, you told me about meeting Pat summit uh, okay. at the banquet that year. Uh, she was the division one coach of the year. And I think it, they were on their way to their third national title in a row, but uh, you got a chance to sit next to her. Is that right? Yeah, so they sit you at the table, and and uh, I'm sitting next to Pat Summit, and they have uh, one of the other coaches of the year, the Division Three Coach of the Year, next to me, and the Junior College Coach of the Year, and so on. But uh, so we're sitting at this table, and it was right after Pat Summit had her um, picture on the front of Sports Illustrated, and I think they were like uh, at that time like 27 and 0 or whatever, but they hadn't lost yet. So, um, and I don't think they did lose that year, but um, so I'm sitting next to Pat Summit and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, this is a great opportunity. I need to get something from it. I got to get a nugget from her or something. I got to learn something from her. I can't waste this opportunity. Um, so she's, you know, so I said, Hey, you know, you've had a great season, you know, tell me a little bit about what you think is, um, the best way to motivate your kids. You know, how do you find the ability to motivate them every single day, every single year. And she tells me that losses are usually what motivates the kids the most. Right. And that she, you know, she went on a little bit explaining it. And of course I was like, you know, in my head, I'm like, Oh my God, they're undefeated. So I, of course, being myself, um, I go, so you didn't learn a whole lot this year, huh? (laughs) And, uh, she just kind of looked at me because she had to think about what she said. Right. And I'm like, yeah, you're 30 and oh, and you haven't lost, you know, so you didn't learn anything. And, um, she kind of did like this side grin. Like it was like, Oh my gosh. Well, in the meantime, the person next to me starts talking to me and asked me a question. I see Pat summit look down, grab her program, hide it from me. And she's looking up to see who the heck I am. Who am I sitting next to? You know? (laughs) So I just remember that moment because I was I just was laughing to myself like she has no idea who I am and that was probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> was there ever a second interaction? Was there any follow up with that? You know, when I'd see her out on the road, she always would say hello. She was always very very nice. Um, 
you know, I didn't really have any in-depth conversation because obviously she's Pat Summit. Everybody wants to talk to her. So when she's in the gym, I mean, she gets bombarded. I honestly, I just wanted to respect her time. Um, I would always obviously say hello. Um, she'd always ask how you're doing, but she does that with everybody. She was one of those kind of people that reached out to everybody. Mm -hmm. Would you study some of the schematics of, of her coaching philosophy and, um, you know, watch them on TV and, and take some of that in your own coaching style? Well, it's funny that you asked that because I was just watching, they had a game on ESPN. Um, it was either yesterday or the day before. So it was Tennessee, I think it was 2004, Tennessee against UConn in the national championship. Um, so I was watching it, um, but they were playing a zone. So I was like, oh, I don't, because I hate zone, you know that. So, um, but I, you know, I have watched um, some of the things that she has done and um, obviously having Jody on our staff, you know, I kind of pick her brain on some of the things they did and some of the scheming that they did and what she thought worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you never had uh, coached against her, had you? Did you, did you guys face off at Mizzou? No. Um, no, I'm trying to think if we ever played Tennessee. We did not. Did you know that Southern Illinois University awards students $10 million annually in scholarships, has test optional admission, and in-state tuition for all U.S. residents? SIU offers hands-on, career-focused learning in every major, which are supported by internships and community service and the potential for study abroad and more. Southern Illinois has faculty who bring real-world experience to the classroom and the classroom into the real world. See what SIU can do for you at the next open house. Registration and info at siu.edu slash open house. Exploring options. That's a Saluki. I almost got to play Gino. We had to play Louisiana Tech first, and we beat them when we were uh, when I was at Missouri. We would have played UConn in the Elite Eight, and we right. ended up losing. But um, that would have been fun. Would that have been 2001, the Sweet 16 year? Yeah. 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 Um, you guys went in, I think, as a 10 seed, upset a couple teams the first two rounds to get to the Sweet 16. That's not an experience a lot of uh, – maybe even some people that work in basketball for a long time get to experience that locker room after that second round game and you win. Uh, what was that locker room like after you beat Georgia? Oh, it was crazy. But, you know, I knew we were going to win. I mean, we were playing in, at Georgia and on a Sunday – like at 11 a.m. I mean, I knew all those people go to church. They're not coming to our game. You know, they, there is no way. So uh, we actually played in front of a pretty quiet crowd. Um, but it was a great team. I mean, and uh, th that was a lot of fun. Our, our kids were fired up and, and ready to go. And um, it was, again, a really good feeling because of the kids we had. I mean, and the time and commitment they put in to, to make that happen. I think your experience is, is so interesting because, um, you know, you've, you've had the assistant, you've had the head coaching side of things, division two, junior college, mid-major, high major, you've, you've been pretty much everywhere. Um, when, when you get to the big 12 and you're at the high major level, um, what's the biggest challenge with all that goes into coaching at that level? I'll be honest. I think the biggest challenge is, um, you are told on so many levels what you need to do and how you need to do it. And it's, it's trying to maintain yourself. Um, I mean, the media is crazy. I mean, they, they nitpick at everything. Um, you know, uh, when I got there, I mean, I had kids that were recruited that weren't division one athletes. They shouldn't have been there. They didn't want to be there. A couple of them didn't want to be there. I mean, I remember one kid running around the track when we were doing conditioning, kept saying, coach, I don't want to be here. And I go, keep going, Angelica. And she, coach, I don't want to be here in the next round. She kept saying it. And finally, she just stopped. And I go, okay, go on home. We'll talk about it. I mean, it was basically she didn't want to be there. And, and that's, but I remember that because the newspaper, the local newspaper was like all the kids that were leaving during my first few years there. One of them was a walk on one, you know, and, you know, I got blamed for that. And, you know, then you're having to people are using against you and recruiting. And that was the other thing. It's like when you're in the Big 12, people just attacked you. I mean, if they thought you're hired an assistants too young, they're using it against you in recruiting. 
you have a newspaper article come out um, about transfers, someone, you know, people are using it against you in recruiting. I mean, it is really cutthroat. Yeah. Um, and, and so that was not the, that wasn't fun. I mean, it just, you're busy doing so many other things and managing different things sometimes that you couldn't control and you were trying to really grab your team. I mean, it was just nonstop of having to battle all the elements, obviously. Yeah. Um, Sounds like there was a lot of political mudslinging going on. Oh, it, and that's what happens at that level. You know, it just, it's just nonstop. And if you can, you know, cushion yourself and isolate yourself from all that, um, you know, you can get it done. But when you're just an upstart program, you're just trying to get things done. We had the worst budget in the league. We had the lowest salaries in the league. You know, we're trying to compete with everybody else. I mean, it got to be, you know, you're just constantly battling and fighting to to make your name known. And it was tough. Yeah. So you you spent 12 years there at Missouri, and then you you finish up and you take two years away from coaching. What are you? Um, where are you at as far as do I want to get back into the game? Do I want to maybe do something else during those two years? Yeah, I really I really like the TV and the radio stuff that I was doing. That was a lot of fun. I really liked that. But I also found out how cutthroat that can be as well. You know, it was like crazy, but. Um, I really enjoyed it, but one of the things that what you do is you sit and you watch a lot of shoot arounds, you watch a lot of practices, you watch a lot of game film, and that's when I started missing the coaching part because I knew that a lot of the stuff that I was doing at Missouri and at Emporia State, those things were all the right things, um, you know. And sometimes you, when you lose your faith in yourself a little bit, because you're like, oh man, I, you know, I, you don't want to mess it up. You know, and we struggled those last four years. We struggled um, to win games. So you look at it very personally. Um, but then you also find, I'm like, you know, we did a lot of things right. Um, and so then it's finding out, well, what can you do to improve that? And where do you need to go um, to get that done? And, um, you know, you learn a lot of that. And you're like, I, I just got that itch to come back. And when I got the call from Illinois Central to return there as the head coach, um, I really, I mean, honestly, I didn't think I'd be at Southern right now. I th thought I'd still be coaching in Peoria, my hometown. And, um, and uh, you know, I got paid well. I had a great job. I loved where I worked every day and was totally happy doing that. Yeah. Winning, too, in that one year there. Um, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that helped. Um, but but why did the SIU job appeal to you? If you were back in your hometown, you were winning, you had a good job. Why why come down to Carbondale? You know, you always have that itch. I mean, I always liked Southern Illinois. It was a school that I actually visited um, when I was looking to to go from Illinois Central. But uh, you know, I I'd give you Mario Mocha was a, a great recruiter. I mean, he when I was uh, we were playing in the national tournament. He came to the games um, and was on, you know, watching our games. So um, he did a great job of recruiting and, and telling me what, what just kind of how special this place was. And I came down for the interview. And honestly, from the you know time I stepped uh, into town, uh, the people were fabulous. I mean, and that reminded me a lot of Emporia because um, people make the place and it was very down to earth and um, great facilities. And, and um, you know, obviously he was thoroughly back in us. And I think that was one of the things too, is like, um, you know, he wanted us uh, to be a premier sport here and, and, you know, he was making sure that we had everything we needed to succeed. I, I wasn't around yet when, when you got hired, but uh, you know, just looking at some of the history before you got hired, uh, the women's program was in a pretty barren place as far as wins and losses, especially through your lens. What did you look at with the Southern program and say, Hey, I can put my imprint on this and, and change things pretty quickly. Well, I thought from a recruiting standpoint, I mean, I th love the, the people. I thought the people were obviously a great sell. The facilities were really, really good. Um, and then obviously the backup of, um, you know, us having good salaries, you could hire good uh, quality staff. Those things were always going to be important. And I felt like 
there was a good group. I had watched them. Um, you know, you had the ability to find their games and watch their games. I felt like there was some talent here that you could definitely develop. Now, my brother, on the other hand, was like, why do you go take a program that's going to take you X amount of wins to get back into a winning column? You're crazy, you know. Um, Cause he was like, you need to pad your record. You need to go somewhere that they're just going to win. He wanted me to stay at ICC. Cause he's like, you know, you know, you're going to win 30 games a year. So, um, but I did think it was a great challenge and I felt like there were all the pieces were in place um, to help turn it around. How hard was that first year when he went uh, for five games? <laughs> yeah, it was brutal. It was brutal. But with that being said, I thought, the, the team, the players, I mean, they were fighting to, to do their best. You know, um, we needed to recruit a couple more pieces um, in it. Um, you know, it was hard. To, not everybody bought in right away. Um, but uh, for the most part, uh, I enjoyed coming to work every day and working with them because you had a, another nucleus of kids that you're like, this group could be pretty special. Mm-hmm. You, uh, I mean, you inherited some good players. You obviously recruited some good players and, um, you know, several 1,000 scorers under you. Had Cartesia Macklin on a couple of weeks ago, and she talked about your influence when she had to miss a year because she had Carson, her son, and how much you helped her through that. I'm curious from, from your side of that, um, how did, I mean, what was your initial reaction when that situation arose and how were you able to help her through that? Well, you could tell, I mean, Cartesia was just a wonderful young lady, but she wasn't very disciplined. So, you know, we actually had a come to Jesus meeting at one point and, and I basically told her if she doesn't get her act together, um, she was leaving. She wasn't having, she wasn't going to have any more chances uh, because she'd have a suspended license here and there. Um, she'd do something else stupid, not go to class or, you know, it was like, we can't have this undisciplined stuff so we basically told her that so I think that when she was telling me she was afraid that I was going to kick her off then she she was afraid that she thought that was a mistake and and honestly um having a child to me is not ha being a, having a mistake I was uh, like there's no way I was going to let her phrase that um as that because um we were going to totally wrap our arms around her and make sure that she had all the things that she needed. Um, but that didn't mean she couldn't still be disciplined. You know, I just, there was just no way I could let that young lady think that um, having a child was going to be a mistake or let it ruin something, an opportunity. There's no way that I would let that happen uh, because she was a great kid and she was trying to do everything the right way. Um, and honestly, I didn't have any problem with her after that. There's, I didn't have one thing that I ever questioned uh, that I was going to have to change my mind on. Um, she did everything right after that. That obviously turned into a, a really good thing for a lot of people, for Cartesia, um, for Carson, having a responsible mom, and seemingly for you guys as a program too, because she comes back, she becomes the all-time leading scorer, and you guys start to win. Uh, yeah. do you look at some of those conversations you had with her kind of as a, a springboard for the success you had after? Well, I think that, I mean, Cartesia, as you know, she's got a great personality and a huge personality. And so what, what she was able to do is actually be such a great, um, leader for our team and help counsel, um, kids growing up and, and kind of growing into that program. I mean, I think that that was huge. I mean, your leadership within your program, I think, is what helps lead you uh, to success. And continuing trying to develop those leaders is crucial. But, you know, Cartesia was easy because she's such a great personality. I mean, she's got such a great heart, you know, and that's what you always knew about her. You know, the kids you got to worry about are the ones you don't know their heart, you know, where are they coming from. And, and you never you never had to guess that on CMAC. You always knew what you had. Yeah, I think that shines even even still today now that she's Absolutely. done playing. Um, I, I did want to circle back. We touched briefly on Title IX and how it impacted you early in your life. Um, saw that it's uh, the anniversary this yeah. week of yeah. Title IX. Uh, you, you have an all-female staff. You obviously are, are leading young women. 
Um, what responsibility do you see in giving opportunities um, to young women from a personal standpoint as far as recruiting and hiring a staff? Yeah, I think that, in fact, I just had an interview today with a grad assistant, um, obviously a female, and I talked a little bit about that as the fact that, you know, I think that anytime there's a, a female out there that played basketball that wants to get into coaching, that it is one of our obligations as women to really highly consider them. Doesn't mean that I won't ever hire a male because I've had male assistants who have been fabulous. But I very rarely have a male that came over from men's basketball because they come over because they're going to get paid well. Uh, those people, I kick them to the bucket. Like there's, they don't even get considered. I've had male assistants that, um, you know, their dad was a, you know, girls basketball coach or college coach, and they grew up with that. Um, those are the, the staff you know is really good. Um, but I also told this young lady, I mean, I feel like anytime I can give somebody that kind of opportunity, um, I want to be able to do so do so and and because I want our kids on our team growing up and seeing how women can be very very successful that's another reason why we started that women mentoring group um, because I want them to see what great successful women we have in this area um, and they have to see it you know so many of them have played for male coaches and sometimes they even um, subconsciously think that if you're standing next to a guy that they know more basketball than you do, you know, and, and I just don't want them having that kind of impression. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't looked at anything statistical or anything like that, but early in your career, um, I'm guessing there were less females in the coaching profession, uh, especially in head coaching spots. Did you feel like you were a minority as a, a female head coach early on? Um, I did not really think it is that. I mean, honestly, I, I didn't give that a whole lot of thought um, to things. I, I Because I do think that there's a lot of men in our field that if they would not have been in our field, we wouldn't be where we are today. I mean, I think we hold a lot of, um, you know, uh, I don't know the right word, but uh, there's a lot of people we owe a lot of gratitude to for because there's a lot of men that started women's programs that really, you know, got it on the board and got it noticed. And I think that we are, you know, we got to be very grateful for that. So I don't want to put everybody in the same category. Right. You know? So, um, and I always said, you know, sometimes your best basketball fans are men that have had daughters. <laughs> yeah you know, and they're fighting for them. And, you know, you just really appreciate them. Yeah, no, that's a good point. It's a good way to think about it. Um, I'll, I'll close with this. When, you know, you have former players or former assistants that go on to hold coaching positions or leadership positions elsewhere, um, I mean, what sort of pride is that for you when, when you see people go on and do that? Yeah, I, th um, I mean, it's huge. I mean, I am always so proud of uh, whether it's former players or, or former staff that go on and to bigger and better things. I think that, um, uh, you know, the biggest thing is they, they've usually become your friends. So you're always very proud of them and, and grateful for everything they did to help you. And you want them to also have great success. You just don't want it against you, but you want them to have great success. Yeah, you hang around the fire long enough, you're going to end up competing against a lot of your friends. Yeah, that's, exactly. So, as uh, as I've learned the last couple of years, <laughs> seems like every every game we do, it's one of your former <laughs> assistants or. Well, I usually know them, and that's the same thing. You know, when the officials walk in and I don't know who they are, you know that that's a bad sign because <laughs> uh, I, I usually know all the officials. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. And uh, this, was, uh, this was fun. Talk All a little right. ball, talk a little life. Yeah, this is good, Connor. Thank you for having me.